Uh, I've studied a lot the use of steroids in otologic surgery, and, and uh, I'm going to skip through a lot of these. And there's a big interest in sudden hearing loss in, in steroids, as you guys know, uh, in the United States. And so uh, we've, we've studied basically all of the etiologies for sudden hearing loss. We've studied all the treatment options for sudden hearing loss. And interestingly, none of them have uh, a significant value, even systemic steroids. So I'm going to skip through a little bit of this. And um, if we had time, I would go through this talk a bit better. Uh, but I want to get on to th this is something worth mentioning. It's a, the autonomy study. Uh, if you look at um, the way we give intratympanic steroids, where's my mouse here, which is this is the uh, time frame that the steroids stay in, in the middle ear. Uh, when it's mixed with a hydrogel, which is a, uh, a substance that goes in as a liquid, forms a gel, stays in the middle ear, you can keep the middle ear concentration of steroids much higher. Is that needed? We don't know. Is that a benefit? We don't really know. But it's possible that as we do hearing preservation, cochlear implantation, that one of the, one of the potentials to preserve hearing would be using a, a long-acting steroid. So I'm going to skip through this. This was a big paper we wrote. And uh, this is, I think this is the wrong talk. Well, maybe this is it. We're doing a lot of talk now. I just mentioned this on unilateral hearing loss. When I first started practicing, uh, there was nothing we could do. Unilateral hearing loss, sudden hearing loss, that's it. Now we have, but it's a big handicap. It's much bigger than we've ever realized. A lot of children with unilateral losses uh, don't do well at school. We've studied this, uh, Anne-Marie Tharp at our university. So we've gone from doing nothing to being able to wear cross-aids, FM systems, bone conduction devices, implantable hearing devices, and cochlear implants. So it's very important with that many options to have uh, what we have at our center, which is a single-sided deafness evaluation. You know, we used to sort of, cow what we call in the U.S. cowboy, you know, where you just put whatever you want on. But then if you do it that way, you could have patients in your waiting room talking to each other. One got a cochlear implant, one got a Baja, one got a cross aid. And if they didn't all know about those options, that wouldn't be a very good uh, 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 informed consent process, right? So while we all have our biases, certain doctors you know, had biases, and, and I have my biases, even our audiologists have their biases, um, they had to hear all those, those options. And we were finding that because of those biases and because of the, an informal process, that patients were getting cochlear implants without hearing about cross-aids, and patients getting a Baja without hearing about cross-aids. And so it's important to organize that at your center and to have you know, it, it in an organized fashion where all of those options. We used to have on that list the sound bite, which is now off the market, too. And a few people chose that. And so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go over these. It's not a, I'm going to skip to the cochlear implant part of the talk. So uh, talk about some of the things. I don't think this is the right talk, but let me just skip to. We've done some things on cochlear implant in our center. Um, one is looking at the non-traditional candidate. Now, we have the single-sided deafness, right? We've done about 30 of those. But as you lose hearing in the better ear, they're still not traditional candidates. We call those non-traditional candidates. And so uh, this ear's a candidate, this ear's not. What do we do with those? You know, Chris, you've, you've talked about this before. Uh, we've done about 30 in our center of pure single-sided deafness. And I'll tell you who does well with that. We've also looked at cochlear implantation in children We've looked at expanding the criteria for, for kids. So uh, for some reason, 
uh, we've lagged behind in children. And as we looked at those non-traditional candidates, those that didn't meet criteria, those that we put an implant in anyway, you can see the pre-implant condition here and the post-implant condition, all of them improved in speech perception, uh, all of them improved in the bimodal condition, some dramatically over their hearing aid, and a huge benefit, uh, an improvement in the ipsilateral ear, and a huge benefit in the bimodal condition. All using these tests, we also saw a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. When you talking about the non-traditional candidates, it might be helpful for the Japanese students to understand what you regard as a traditional concrete implant candidate, because I think the criteria might be quite different. Uh, okay, what is the criteria in Japan? So the current criteria in Japan? Yeah, and it's not allowed either. I want to make that point clear for, uh, but these are candidates where I've talked about single sided just briefly. I'll talk about it again here, but um, these are candidates that. Um, even in planning their poor hearing ear, they weren't candidates because of their, their, their good ear was too good, right? It, it met, didn't meet criteria, which our criteria, I'll go back to that slide that, that pointed out to our criteria. I want to cover this before Doug gets here. So let's look at hearing preservation. Every year, every couple of years, there's a hot topic in cochlear implantation. It's, you know, meningitis one year, it's bilateral cochlear implantation, um, it's seemingly now it's the two hot topics are single-sided deafness. We talk about that a lot in hearing preservation and that we'll be riding that wave for a while uh, until the next topic comes along. There's evolving criteria. These are the criteria uh, here. Uh, uh, 98, these are the, two, the current criteria for adults. Uh, and children. That's what you were wanting for us. So I think we have a looser criteria than you guys, it sounds like. Uh, and even then, even with our looser criteria, when we implant people with better hearing than this, we do better, right? So um, these are the current criteria um, on a graph here. Speech recognition greater than or equal to 50 percent um, in best aided condition. So our criteria are less strict. Um, we're implanting more probably because our, we're having more and more patients meet criteria. Even, as I said, even when we go beyond this, which we do a lot in our center, we find a test which makes them a candidate. And I've never once wished we hadn't implanted someone. So when we go off-label, when we implant someone with more and more and more hearing, there's never been one time when someone's come in and said, I wish I hadn't had this cochlear implantation. Uh, I heard better with my hearing aid. Have you anybody ever heard that? It, so obviously our criteria needs to expand. In some ways, it's been said we should have some patients out on the end of that bell-shaped curve saying that. Uh, there should be a few, right? Because we have to include, in order to include everybody who would benefit. So it's an interesting thing. And so these are some of the predictors of cochlear implant performance. We've seen this over and over and over again, haven't we? All of this but what's interesting about this list, now what operation do we have where the predictor of surgical success has nothing to do with the surgeon, right? Do you see anything about surgical skill or surgical experience on this? It's for years and years and years, uh, it was all these things. All of these are reasons why this patient's not doing well, right? But it was never the surgeon's skill, right? We just put it in the cochlea and they didn't do well. It was all these, the, all of these reasons. But now we are entering an era where your your ability as a surgeon will have a direct influence on the patient's outcome. Do you guys agree? 
So it's no longer are we just putting it in and it's someone else's fault. So we're putting these in and uh, how we put them in matters. And we've finally determined that. So as we start to implant more and more and more people with that good hearing, we have a lot of hearing to preserve. So you hear a lot about hearing preservation, but you don't hear much about hearing loss because you can lose that hearing too. And that's, that's what we worry about at our center. Doug said yesterday, no matter how bad the hearing is, you still try to preserve the hearing. Why do you do that? Well, if you're gonna put a cochlear implant in my ear, I want you to be careful. I wanna preserve, even if my basilar membrane's not working, even if my organ of corti is not working well, I want it preserved. I think I'll have a better outcome. And we have studies that show that. So we have studies that show that the more carefully you place the implant, uh, even in the implant condition alone, even if you lose hearing, you're gonna have a better outcome. So these are some, even in my center, that slide's not coming up well, we have skeptics. We, as little as two or three years ago, our, our primary researcher didn't believe in hearing preservation. He, all these reasons, these were the reasons, I, I kept a list of the reasons he said hearing preservation is of no benefit. But we do know Gantz showed that hearing preservation was important. It's been shown that placing the cochlear implant in the right spot matters. Steve, you've got a talk on this, right? Yeah. I'll let you do that. Um, Renee Gifford at our center showed that uh, the standard electrode array, could, we can preserve hearing up to 55% of the time. Um, and it can improve performance in the cochlear implant only condition. And that's why it's important because it's not just you don't win or lose if you've saved hearing or not. You're going to win just because the implant will work better if you try to use hearing preservation techniques and get it in the right scala. Uh, I'll skip through a little bit of this. So we have nine implant surgeons at our center. With this expanding criteria, we have an active implant director. This has been key for us because she d drives who's a candidate. If you can drive who's a candidate, you're going to increase your volume. Uh, hearing preservation is easy to track, right? Implant performance is hard to track. You know, I can put in nine Med-Ls and 25 advanced bionics and uh, 30 co co nucleus devices, and they're all going to have different levels of performance, but it's going to be based on all those other criteria, right? All those other length of deafness and, and things. But hearing preservation is easy. It's easy to track. You, you, you did a post-op hearing test, and if there's hearing, you saved hearing. If there's not, you didn't. So we're able to really carefully track our hearing preservation rates. And it creates a competition in our, in our center, right? The audiologists know who's saving hearing the best. Uh, we know. We're tracking our own numbers. That's how you get better. You, you look at these things. You want to look at your own numbers uh, and see if you're saving hearing. These are all the reasons why we should lose hearing and probably why we do lose hearing almost half the time. You want to get things into the scala timpani. We want to use short electrodes. How short? Nobody knows, right? Uh, the shorter the electrode, the higher the likelihood there is of preserving hearing. But do you give up performance by not covering the entire cochlea? Makes sense? So we're, that's what we're looking for. This is Bruce's work. Uh, this is uh, examples of atraumatic soft electrodes. These are some of the techniques we use. Remove all bone, use hemostasis, avoid bone dust into the cochlea, use a small cochleostomy. We really prefer a round window. I mean, we do. We, we, we're almost exclusively round window insertion. Don't suck the perilymph. Uh, sh um, place the device first, then you make your opening, and then put it in. You don't want to make the opening and go fool around up putting the device in and then coming back. Uh, short, um, smooth, slow insertion speeds. We talked a little bit yesterday, if you're gonna make an opening into the round window, do you make it big 
or do you make it small? If you make it small and you're putting uh, a silastic electrode in, what happens to the fluid, right? Does it come out? Is, that, is, that, is, it, is it favorable for the fluid to come out, or is it favorable to push it and have the fluid stay in and maybe rupture the membranes? Chris and I spoke briefly about that yesterday, and I think that you prefer a wider opening. Is that correct? Makes sense. You let the fluid come out so it doesn't blow up the, uh, the cochlear membranes. I'm going to be ready in about a minute or two. Okay. So we use steroids. We use pre-op steroids, intraoperative steroids, post-operative steroids. We send patients home with steroids. Uh, Bruce Gantz actually will activate patients on steroids. Um, careful packing. We, we're, we're plus and minus on intratympanic steroids. We like round window. I don't think this video will, will play. Um, Doug will show this, I'm sure, in, in a minute. So I'm skipping over that. Here's just some work we've done. These are the typical hearing preservation rates, which we have. Uh, are you seeing any difference amongst the different electrodes in terms of preservation? Uh, like most, you know, the longer the electrode, we're, we're, we're at, like all the centers. We, we want to put the longest electrode in um, to cover the cochlea and preserve the hearing. What number is that, right? Um, we don't want to lose hearing and have a little tiny electrode in. We also don't want to put in a, a, a huge electrode and lose hearing all the time. So we're weighing that. And, uh, you know, we're, we're at the point where we're looking at, you know, 28 millimeters is probably the the, the longest we put in and, and reasonably expect to preserve hearing. And the better the hearing that they have, the shorter we go. And I don't know if that's the right thing, but I think that's what most people are doing. You know, if you put in a, a big electrode, you're going to lose hearing a lot, but you're going to have a good performing uh, cochlear implant. And if you put in a short electrode every time, you'll have high hearing preservation rates, but probably not the performance. And what do you think? I mean, we're, we're looking at our numbers right now and, and uh, uh, trying to uh, figure that, that question out. Mm -hmm.